YouTube channel um, once I get rid of the, the front ends a bit. Uh, before we start, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians on the land in which we all gather and we work and we live. For me here in Townsville, it's Lugurukaba and Bindal people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. A bit about me, my name is Ray Thomas. I am the Research Education Lead for the Tropical Australian Academic Health Centre. I have been a researcher for quite some time, and now I have the pleasure of teaching clinicians all about research and helping them with their research projects. The basic goal about today is to foster your curiosity about, about research translation and about low value care. Um, and you're going to be taught, you're going to have conversations with two researchers um, who are going to highlight really interesting programs of research um, from very, very different jurisdictions, which is something that we haven't done on our TARC webinar series yet. But the two different jurisdictions are united in their passion about reducing low value care and using research translation principles to do that. And so that's why I'm really excited to be talking today with Adrian and Vinay, and I'll introduce them a little bit later. A little bit about TARC, just to orient you to what we're doing. Um, TARC is the Tropical Australian Academic Health Centre, and we are a nationally um, accredited, NHNMRC accredited, Research Translation Centre. So we are a collaboration up here. We are a company. We are a collaboration between five hospital and health services in Northern Queensland. So that's Cairns and Hinterland, Mackay, Northwest, Torres and Cape, and Townsville. We're also partners with the NQPHN and the Queensland Aboriginal Islander Torres uh, Health Council and James Cook University. So there's eight partners to TARC. We have four research themes, and they are service delivery for real, root, rural, remote and regional. They're innovative health workforce models because we have a lot of problems up here about well, workforce. We want to talk about the non-communicable diseases and high re regional prevalence, and we also talk about infectious diseases. So they're the four research themes that encompass TARC. Bit of webinar housekeeping. Um, just to let you know that please mute your microphones while we're having our conversations um, until the Q&A. We're going to hold all Q&A until the end of the talks where you're free to ask, raise your hand or talk or, or talk out loud, any kind of questions that you might have. Um, what we do like is even though you've muted your microphones, it's always really kind of nice to see faces. So if you feel like you're able to turn on your camera so that we can see you, that'd be great merely because it's much easier to speak when you're actually seeing some faces than it is to speak to a series of black and white kind of names. So that'd be a good one. All right. So my job today is to just sit, briefly set the stage for Adrian and Vinay. And I'm going to talk about and outline what is meant, what do we mean when we're talking about research translation, and what do we mean when we're talking about low-value care? So I think we can kind of all agree, right, that knowledge derived from research and experiences is of little value unless it's actually put into practice. There's no point in all of us researchers squirreling away in our little offices having very exciting conversations with ourselves and writing lovely articles unless we actually do something with it. And in fact, it is remarkable and lamentable that many years often elapse before an important and scientifically established discovery in either theory or practice of medicine becomes essentially constituent of diagnosis and treatment in the hands of the practicing physician. And I think that's really important, but I also think it's very, very lamentable that that statement was actually written in 1896. And I don't think it's changed very much since then. It's 127 years ago. So the difference between what we know in research and what we practice in the real world is known as the evidence practice gap, right? And this whole idea about research translation is that bridge. So you've got your knowledge that we know from research, which is half the bridge, but the other half of the bridge, the gap, is how do we translate that knowledge? How do we put that research knowledge into the hands of the clinician and change how we practice 
going back to research principles, going back to what we know. And that gap is filled by theories and frameworks called research translation and implementation science. We know that um, without research translation, without us actively figuring out how do we embed this knowledge into our clinical practice, on average, it takes at least 17 years for practices to change. But we also know that if we do use research implementation and, and, and research translation principles, that can take up to three years, not 17 years. So that's why it's really important for us to think about how do we gather our research knowledge and more importantly, potentially, is put it into practice. So the nerdy definition really um, from Canada pr principally is that research translation is a dynamic and iterative process that includes synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound application of knowledge to improve health, provide more effective health services and products, and strengthen the healthcare system. But it's also really super acknowledged that this all takes place in a very, very complex system of interactions between researchers and the knowledge users, the clinicians, which vary depending on the nature of the research findings and the needs of the knowledge um, users. And the reason why research translation is so important is because of this challenge. And this is known as the 60-30-10 challenge in healthcare. And it was uh, an article in 2020 was led by Jeffrey Braithwaite and a couple of others who looked at this challenge and found out that around about 60% of what we do in health is in line with evidence-based or consensus-based guidelines, right? 30% of what we do in health is a form of waste or it's a form of low-value care. And 10% of what we do in health is, is harmful. So what do we mean by low value care? What's the definition that we're gonna be working at today? This was, this was discussed and written about by Ian Scott and Stephen Duckett in 2015. And they said that the use of treatment or medical tests where evidence suggests confers no or very little benefit for patients or risk of harms exceeds likely benefits or more broadly, it, the added cost of the intervention do not provide proportional added benefits. So that's the definition of low-value care, according to Ian and Steve. But it's really actually very important to note that there are very, very few clinical tests that we use that have no value in any clinical encounter, right? There are hardly any tests have no value whatsoever. But equally so, hardly any tests are universally beneficial in any clinical encounter either, right? So most tests and treatments are in the grey zone, okay, where they might be appropriate if applied in different circumstances. And the value of that test, whether it's low value or high value, really kind of depends on who, what, where, how, and when. And there are three types of low value care. The first is ineffective care, right? So that's care where you're providing care that's actually not indicated. So let's pretend like, you know, you might be providing an MRI for a lumbar hernia, right? You don't need that, so that's ineffective care. Another type of care might be inefficient care. And that kind of care is usually comes about by lack of coordination, right? So if you think about inefficient care, it might be something like you've got um, repeat blood tests for the same person for the same thing because it hasn't no one's had time to write it in the file or nobody knew that somebody else had done it so you've got repeat blood tests so that's inefficient care and finally you've got something called unwanted care which is where the patient's values and preferences aren't aligned to the treatment that's being provided so an example of that might be um, really intensive um, interventions at end of life care when the patient has actually asked that they want minimal, limited interventions in end of life care. So that's me. I'm done. You didn't really come here to hear me. You came here to hear Adrian and Zanae. So what I'm going to do is I'll stop sharing my screen and Adrian will pull up his hopefully if we can manage that. 
and I'll introduce Adrian to you. So Adrian Traeger is a physiotherapist and University of Sydney Robinson Fellow at the School of Public Health, Faculty of Medicine and Health. His research focuses on patient provider communication and the overuse of unnecessary health care for back pain. So today Adrian's going to talk about a series of pilot research and the lessons learned from this research that actually helped him move forward and led to an NHMRC funded trial. So over to you, Adrian. Thanks very much, Ray. Am I coming through okay? Yep, and slides look okay for you too. Yep, great. Thanks very much for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here to speak with you and your team. And um, so I'm coming to you from Daragland, which is in the northwest of Sydney. And um, as Ray said, I'm, I'm a re full-time research fellow. I have a, a clinical background in physiotherapy, but now I spend all my time doing research. And um, so for this talk, I, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the research we've done on low value care for back pain. Um, and I'll, so that'll be a sort of the first half of the talk. And then the second half, I was going to introduce you to the, the large trial that we're doing um, to try and improve care in emergency departments in um, Southwest Sydney. Um, yeah, so the background to, to this um, research is that, you know, back pain is one of the leading causes of years lived with disability worldwide. It's a leading reason to visit an emergency department um, in an Australian hospital and also globally. Um, and we know that um, some aspects of care are overdone um, and some aspects of care are underdone. So the guidelines for back pain really are uh, to rule out serious pathology. And you do that with a clinical examination and from careful questioning of the patient. Um, routine diagnostic imaging isn't recommended for people who come in with back pain unless they have features of serious pathology. And also complex medicines like opioids aren't, or aren't recommended for back pain either. So simple medicines, paracetamol, you know, ibuprofen, um, they're the ones we should be going with. And non-drug interventions, that's really where care is going for back pain. But we know that is really underdone and uh, the complex medicines um, are, are really overdone. So, um, yeah, we did a little bit of research um, at a hospital in Sydney. So... We looked at through the case notes of people who came in through ED with back pain and um, coded their notes against the guidelines to measure sort of the scale of this uh, inappropriate imaging. So imaging for people who um, didn't have those features of serious pathology like cancer or a neurological compromise. And we found that of the proportion of imaging tests, of, of, of all imaging tests done for back pain, around one in three were unnecessary. So that's sort of fits a little bit with um, the figures that Ray presented in her initial slides. But, um, you know, it's it's not a huge number, but I think, you know, when we did this research, we thought that could definitely be improved. The other interesting part of this research was we looked at the people who did have indications for imaging but didn't receive the test. So, you know, that's also an issue with back pain. So the people who need the tests aren't getting them. And the people who don't need the tests are sometimes getting them as well. So we found that figure was about 4%, which is quite an important number because if you miss serious pathology in back pain, um, it can cause problems um, in the long term. So the other bit of background to this was more research in, in Sydney-based EDs, and we looked at the care provided, particularly the use of medicines in ED, um, emergency departments for back pain. And this research found that um, about 70% of patients received an opioid medicine. Um, and we know that's uh, discouraged in current clinical guidelines, as I said at the start of my talk. Um, interesting to note from this research, only about half of the people who came in with a, a sore back actually had a lumbar spine related issue. So that adds to the complexity when we're starting to talk about reducing the number of unnecessary scans. There's some complexity there when 50% of the people coming in who have a sore back don't actually have a spine-related problem. So um, these were all sort of the, the findings we, we were starting to look at uh, when we're thinking about how to improve care. Another bit of background to this problem is the effectiveness of opioids. So this was done, um, a trial out of our group that was published in The Lancet um, this year, so by my colleague Caitlin Jones and Christine Lynn. Um, and they looked at the efficacy of um, opioids for back pain. You may have heard of this trial. It was called the OPAL trial. And 
these are pain scores over time in people with acute back issues who received an opioid medicine versus a placebo. Orange is the opioid medicine, placebo is in grey. And so you can see over time, placebo had better pain scores than the opioid, which was kind of astounding um, to many doctors and, um, you know, really caused a stir globally. But this is just an additional piece of information um, suggesting that opioids aren't as necessary as we once thought to manage people with back pain. Um, and when we think about what's actually causing this, I mean, the drivers of low value care are very complex and I'm not going to go into it in, in the 15 minutes that I've got to talk about my research, but the things that we've been looking at in this ED context, I've, I've outlined on the slide. So we know um, from some of the research we've done that beliefs um, that opioids are efficacious for back pain can drive, you know, prescribing. We know that sometimes it's just, a, it's, it can happen out of habit. Um, and we know that there are training related issues in terms of guidelines. One issue that's a problem in um, private practice and in primary care and in the private sector is obviously financial incentives. We know that in some places doing more scans or providing more uh, opioids can actually have financial incentives to the doctors, but that's obviously not a problem in ED. And we also know that time and the clinical environment and, and the local culture also could be influencing this prescribing behaviour more so than the doctor actively going, well, this is the best care I need to give my patient. And so to dig into the cognitive bias issue, we did an experiment. This was with GPs, not with emergency department doctors, where we just, all we did was we gave them scenarios and we reoriented the options that we, they were the same options, but we reoriented how they were positioned on the screen. So high value care came up first as though it was the default. default. And low value care, we sort of put at the bottom of the screen or we hit it behind a click. And we found that just reorienting the computer screen could reduce the odds that that doctor would say they'd prescribe that sort of care by 44%. So, you know, this is exactly the same options, exactly the same scenario, just a, a switch in the, the way the computer screen was oriented. Um, we published that in BMJ Quality and Safety a few years back. Um, and in terms of that belief issue, which we, we've uncovered with some qualitative work and qualitative systematic reviews, we thought, well, you know, Patients and clinicians from qualitative work, it's, it's suggested that many have strong beliefs about the need for imaging. So a lot of patients believe they do need imaging to, to properly diagnose their back pain and some clinicians believe that too. And so we're, when we're approaching that problem, we thought, well, is it enough to give a patient who strongly believes they need a scan for proper management of their back just to give them information about the benefits and harms of of scans for back pain, or do we need to use more uh, persuasive approaches? So this was another experiment we did. We developed a leaflet on, on back pain that could be distributed in hospitals. And this was done in collaboration with um, a marketing company. So we went down into the city and the CBD and went to the um, advertisers who advertised McDonald's and junk food to people. And we said, how would you advertise the potential harms of an unnecessary scan to the public? And they came up with this, fairly garish campaign that was sort of almost like an anti-smoking campaign, but uh, we subsequently had to soften it. Um, and I'll show you later what the public thought of this, this approach. But this was another way of trying to get in, you know, and, and tackle those beliefs that we know can be quite strong and, and can just and can drive preferences for, for care. I don't expect you to read this in detail, but on the left-hand slide, we developed a leaflet that was very neutral and just presented the benefits and harms of scans. And on the right-hand side, we focused heavily on the harm. So it's more of a biased way of communicating health information. So we'd call the one on the right health promotion and we'd call the one on the left more like a shared decision-making approach. So one's kind of persuasive, one's neutral. And we found that in a randomised experiment, giving people, unsurprisingly, giving people biased information that sort of tried to talk them out of getting a scan unless they really needed it, reduced intentions for them to ask for a scan when they came into the ED um, by about one point on a 10 point scale. So we thought that was, you know, an interesting signal of, of, of an approach that could work against this problem. 
And of course, when you start to use this strong messaging, there can be public pushback. So I mentioned that we went to the marketers and they came up with this fairly strong campaign that was almost like the Grim Reaper campaign to raise awareness of HIV back in the 80s. Um, and we did focus groups with community members um, and they immediately thought there was some hidden agenda when when you when we were proposing we were going to put posters like this up in hospitals to raise awareness of potentially unnecessary care they thought there was a political motive that the hospital was trying to save money that it was misleading and and you know there's really this financial incentive to cut down on care when in actual fact the intention behind this campaign would be to improve care for back pain not to deprive people of tests that they need so that we had to go back and edit the campaign to try and find a little bit more nuance to what the advertisers gave us. Um, and we piloted these down in southwest Sydney. And in the interest of time, I'll just skip that slide um, and move forward to the trial, which was, you know, and, the, and what we did when we'd done all that pilot work was we put together a proposal for the NHMRC and we said, can we try and test these in a really robust way in a randomised trial? The posters facing patients, and the changes to the computer screen for uh, the doctors. And we were lucky enough to get funded for this, for this trial, which is called Nudged. And the reason it's called Nudged is because these behavioral cues, the posters, the computer screen changes um, are known as, they're based on this theory of behavioral economics where you know just the, the decision makers environment can influence how they make decisions. Um, so we put the proposal into NHMRC and we got funding um, and this is the team, um, again, don't expect you to read all the names, but um, I was leading the grant and, and uh, my colleague, um, Sui, was our project manager, PhD student Gemma in the corner is doing her PhD on the project. We had um, orthopedic surgeons, emergency department doctors, behavioural experts, statisticians and consumers all involved in this project. Um, and this is the research question of this larger trial. So. We're looking to implement this um, in people who are over 18 and come into the ED with a musculoskeletal related back problem. The intervention are going to be those posters and, and resources for patients, which will be in the waiting room on these large digital screens. Um, there'll be pop-ups on the clinician's computer. Um, that's the second intervention. And then we're going to combine the interventions to see if there's a super additive effect. And we're comparing it with no intervention and we're looking at an outcome of low value care. So we're going to be reading notes and seeing how many people, when these interventions were implemented, how many people got a non-indicated imaging test, how many people got an opioid when they were discharged, which the doctors agreed is an unnecessary use of an opioid when you're discharging someone home with back pain with, with an opioid medicine um, or both. And so this is the research design. So there's eight hospitals in Nudged. Um, these are all in... Uh, southwestern Sydney, which is a very culturally diverse area of Sydney. So we've had to translate all of the posters into five languages, Arabic, Assyrian, Vietnamese, simple Chinese, and get the mix right for each of our hospitals. So um, the posters are locally translated depending on um, the patient mix at, at, at the hospital. Um, and so two hospitals will get the, the, the messages showing in the waiting room. Two hospitals will get the pop-ups on the computer at the doctors who are trying to prescribe opioids or imaging it pops up. And I'll show you an example of what it looks like in the next couple of slides. Two hospitals will get the double and two will get nothing. And, that, and they're randomised um, in a cluster way to, to that. And then the light blue shows that we're going to have an observation period. Before we do any intervention, we're going to observe what's happening just in um, nature before we go in and start intervening. Um, here's another way of showing the study design. So it's going to be, we're estimating around 2,500 back pain encounters over, over 12 months um, across the eight hospitals. And we're looking to measure low value care after implementing these for about nine months. And so here's the, the patient facing intervention. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see this. So we put these screens in all eight of our hospitals. I just got back from one this morning and uh, the hospitals are just showing normal communi ED communications because uh, the trial hasn't started. And, and um, feedback from on the ground is that they're really, um, really positive feedback 
no one's, you know, tried to smash it yet, uh, but we're only a few months in. Uh, it's always a risk, but they're all bolted to the floor so they can't be sort of pulled over. And in the bottom part of the slide, that shows one of the, the, the posters that's in Arabic that I think looks quite beautiful. Um, the, the font looks very, that's my favourite of the posters, even though it's a little bit of a scary message. So, And the slogan that we got from the advertisers is scan your options, which, is, which I quite like because um, the whole thing we're trying to communicate is look at what your options are. You don't always need a scan. You don't always need opioids. And then there's going to be digital versions of the patient information. And then so here on the left, we've got an alert that comes up when a doctor attempts to um, order an imaging test. And so they're given links out to the clinical indications for when you would need a, a spinal imaging test. Um, or they can proceed and it's just a nudge. So it's not actually sh stopping them proceeding. They can go ahead and order the scan if they think that's, you know, if it's an 80 year old uh, woman who's had a fall at home, there's absolutely no problem proceeding with, um, you know, the X-ray. So, and same goes for opioids. So when, when opioids are prescribed, um, these alternative medicines that pop up um, that are currently recommended in clinical guidelines. So, but they can proceed with the opioid request if they wish um, okay, I'm, I'm at my 15 minutes and that was most of what I was going to say, but I guess from a perspective of people um, trying to design experiments in their healthcare setting and do some research translation work, these are some of my reflections on, on trying to set up a large trial across health di different health districts. Um, is getting you know lots of public um, feedback on on these interventions, it, particularly if it's a patient-facing intervention, is critical. Um, we found that beliefs on both sides were still challenging when we're talking about intervening to improve care, um, making it sound like when and when you're trying to reduce care, we're not trying to deprive patients of anything. So, um, having discussions about replacing one type of care with another can be um, helpful. There's obviously governance issues when you're doing these intervene, interventions and particularly as a university um, representative, even though I'm a district worker, it's much easier if you're in the district doing research in the district. Once you're an external person, things get super complicated. Um, and obviously finding skilled clinical trial staff is, is difficult in Sydney, let alone, you know, um, tropical Queensland. I'm sure that that's challenging as well. Um, and obviously communication and relationships is is critical. But I might just finish there so we have plenty of time for discussion. I'll let Vino take over and I'll just acknowledge my collaborators in the work that I've presented. And sorry if it was a little bit rushed, but I'm very happy to take questions and thanks very much for listening. Thank you. And we've got we've got plenty of time, so that's okay. No need no need to feel rushed at all. So thanks heaps, Adrian. Nice work. No worries. I've got questions, but I'll but True to form, I'm going to leave it till the end. Like I told everybody, have the pause on their questions. Sounds um, good. So Thanks, Ryan. If you stop sharing, we'll let um, Vinay share. Assuming, Vinay, that you're okay to share. Otherwise, I can I can do that for you. Uh, I'll, I'll try and share. Yep, no worries. And while you're doing that, may I introduce, please, Vinay Genkthamaya. He is the Emergency Physician and Director of Emergency Medicine Research at Townsville University Hospital. He is passionate about research capacity building and from what I've seen, what I hear and what I know, he transfers this passion to those around him. Um, he re his research interests include de-implementation of low-value emergency care, acute pulmonary embolism diagnosis and improving patient flow. And your slides are up. You are good to go. Let's see how we go. Excellent. Thanks for that. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Ray, for the introduction. So as Ray said, um, I'm an emergency physician by trade, and I've been looking into low-value care in general and low-value tests in particular in the emergency department for the last few years. So today I'm going to share with you some of the findings uh, of the research that um, I and some of my colleagues have been involved in in the last couple of years. So I'll make a start. So the, the talk will essentially be initially about just a bit of introduction about what low value tests and care are, and then mostly about the research project that I did early this year, where I asked emergency physicians 
about um, what they think are the drivers of low value tests in our emergency department. And I'm gonna sort of finish up with what I plan to do to try and address these drivers. So low value tests as Ray and Adrian have mentioned are defined in different ways. I have chosen a definition that I've, uh, I've tried to simplify it uh, to try and increase the buying, so to speak, of, of, of clinicians. Um, so I have sort of started using this ineffective and ine inefficient tests that do not benefit patients um, are low value tests. And, and low value tests, as Ray mentioned, are are quite common. I would say they're quite common. Um, and the literature globally suggests that up to a third of all tests that are performed are, are, are low value. <clears throat> and 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 so so why should we care if they're, they're being done? So they're just tests. The reason we need to care is if low value tests can harm patients, they can harm clinicians, and they can harm healthcare systems. So the harm to patients is in the form of unnecessary needles um, when they have blood tests, unnecessary um, risk of cancer when they're exposed to radiation from imaging tests, um, unnecessary anxiety and stress from false positive test results that lead on to this entire downstream tests or treatments. Um, and very pertinent to us in the emergency department is suboptimal care due to unnecessarily long wait times. So in the emergency department literature over the last two decades has shown that longer wait times actually harm patients, um, increasing morbidity and mortality. So suboptimal care, um, if the patients wait longer to actually get the test, then that not only affects their care, but also affects everyone else's care. So what's being done in, in this space uh, for over a decade now, multidisciplinary specialists across the world have been trying to reduce low value care in general and low value tests in particular through evidence-based recommendations under the Choosing Wisely campaign. But what they've realized and what emerging data shows is evidence-based recommendations are, are necessary, but, but not sufficient. So what's needed, as, as Ray um, told us, is the translation of that evidence. Um, so the first step in translation is, is to ask ourselves, is this real, really a problem? How common it is? Um, how, how prevalent is it? So... We did some studies in our emergency department last year, which showed that half of all non-contrast CT head scans in patients with minor head injury and syncope, half of all blood cultures in all comers, half of all coagulation studies, and about a third of CTPA scans in patients with suspected pulmonary embolism were low value when compared to evidence-based recommendations. So they are happening. So the, the next question was, um, what can we do about it? Uh, or even before that, what what's causing all these low value tests to happen? So to answer that question, we did this study uh, early this year where uh, it was a qualitative study where uh, I interviewed consenting emergency clinicians. And it was a purposive sample chosen to ensure that there was the right mix um, of and right balance of uh, participants when it comes to experience, it comes to gender distribution. Um, so I ended up interviewing 24 uh, of my colleagues. 19 were emergency physicians and five were emergency medicine trainees. Um, and there, uh, there was a, a, an equal number of male and female uh, participants, and their experience varied from one to three years of advanced training for emergency medicine trainees, and two to 18 years 
of specialist uh, experience for emergency physicians. So the first question I asked them was, what does low value mean to you? Um, and these were some of the responses I got. So low value tests do not add to the care of the patient in the journey through the emergency department. And, and I'll, I'll let you have a read of that. Things that either do not help us get any closer to a diagnosis or affect the management of a patient. And obviously we're doing a lot of low value tests. So the second question I asked them um, was, so what, what do you feel is driving low value tests in our emergency department? Um, and, and these were some of the things that emerged from the interviews. So uh, efficiency, resources, abilities, consequences, complexity, and culture, and sort of similar themes to what Adrian mentioned. Um, and obviously, I've tried to bunch together multiple different uh, thoughts, views, perspectives under boxes that make sense. So I'm just going to talk about each one of them and share some of the participants' thoughts about each of them. Um, all right, um, it looks like I've changed it. So I'm just going to talk about it. So efficiency, as I mentioned, <clears throat> efficiency is paramount uh, because timely emergency care um, improves outcomes and any delay in care uh, worsens outcomes. Um, so efficiency was one of the key things that came up. Resources, uh, participants talked about resources in terms of access to space, access to tests, um, and access to staff. And abilities were spoken about in terms of clinician knowledge, clinician skills, and clinician experiences. And, and consequences seem to play on clinicians' minds. So conse consequences were uh, discussed in terms of uh, complaints being reported to the medical board, uh, fear of litigation, um, and complexities of, uh, of, um, of, of change management, complexities of cognitive load um, and, and diagnostic uncertainty. Um, and the most important... My apologies. That was uh, entirely un unscripted. Um, and culture, culture is 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 the way we do things in in our department in our hospital in our profession and and in our community so participants felt that culture within our department is how we role model senior clinicians role modeling to junior clinicians as well as what sort of messages we send to junior clinicians and the interactions we have with other disciplines, the interactions we have with patients and patient expectations, um, leadership, our habits, um, and, and all of those things sort of um, had a significant influence on, on low value tests. So to put it together, all of these things, uh, both individual and systemic level factors, the participants felt were leading to low value diagnostic tests. To look at it another way, low value tests will continue to occur in situations where clinicians have sufficient abilities, but there are inadequate resources or excessive concern about consequences. 
or extreme complexity or powerful cultural influences, um, and most importantly, the overwhelming need for efficiency that drives us all. Participants had, had some thoughts about how we could navigate some of these barriers. Um, we should be tailoring our investigations and management to that particular patient. Have the clinician making decisions with investigations physically be in that patient space before they can even press the order on anything. Faculty of emergency physicians to decide we can provide some guidance. Think better defense against medical legal risk is conducting appropriate assessments and documenting very clearly why stuff has happened. Support each other when we go through those stages of competence, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring can be quite powerful. And giving people the vision, um, particularly the juniors. So that that was sort of a, a brief summary of what the project was. As, as that the participants expressed a wide spectrum of drivers, majority of them systemic um, and some of them individual that are interacting uh, together to drive the performance of these low value tests. So what I plan to do over the next two to three years is first try and um, get uh, focus groups of community members to actually ask them uh, their thoughts, because one of the things that came up was uh, patient expectations uh, as, as, as a cultural sort of theme driving these tests and eventually design a multifaceted intervention, um, which has all of these components that you can see on the slide. So um, the literature review that I did as part of my research showed that these are some of the components that have been tested in, in interventions uh, in emergency medicine over the last two decades. So some of these are um, quite, um, I guess, intuitive or uh, familiar. So, but the most important one um, that most studies have found is the stakeholder engagement. The so stakeholder engagement is is just everyone who's part of the change being uh, involved in the change right from the conception and design of the intervention all through to implementation and evaluation. So uh, that's one of the key things that I I'm already doing, hopefully with the clinicians, with um, all of these uh, studies that I've done so far, but there's uh, the other key stakeholders are the community members. Um, I have been lucky and fortunate enough that I've managed to uh, get two community members uh, on board as, as community collaborators of our project. Um, they are now part of all decisions, um, including the design of the phase and what sort of questions we should ask and and how to deal with uh, the focus groups. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that so that we can have more time to discuss um, and, and deliberate. Um, over to you, Ray. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, excellent. You just, yep. Yeah. You're still sharing your screen. All good. All right, thank you. Great great talks. Um, I do have questions, but I'll hold it over to the floor first. Does anybody um, online have any questions for either Adrian or Vinay? All right, you're too shy. I'll go first. I don't mind going first. Okay. So I'm actually really interested. So both of you, both of you, um, 
uh, consulting with community. I mean, that that's a big, obviously, that, that's really important in research. We do it. Um, you've both got community engagement on your projects at varying degrees. Um, the first question I have is to Adrian. I, when I heard about, um, you know, the community, the focus groups that you did and how they responded to the advertising campaigns that were made up for you initially, it was quite, it was quite the surprise, I suppose, for me, certainly, it was quite the, quite the backlash. How did you, how did you deal with that? And I know that you changed it because of their feedback, but what are some of the tips that you might give us so that we can potentially avoid just a little bit of what you went through that I, I remember? Am I coming through? Yes. Yeah, sorry, my headphones just died, so just <laughs> wanted to halfway through your question, but I did hear it all. Um, yeah, so... Um, it was a little bit of a traumatic experience, but uh, and I'm not sure I have all the answers, but I'm I'm glad to see Vinay's lining up for a <laughs> community focus groups because <laughs> you know it was it was just really eye opening and it was so valuable um, to the development of the intervention. You know, we had I almost got shirt fronted at one stage. You know, like um, Mark Latham style. <laughs> I was facilitating the the group, and um, you know the anger. There, the, there was really pure anger, um, and and it was you know partly because there were some big personalities in the group. So we did two different focus groups, and advice I've been I'm not a qualitative researcher. But I've done I've done a bit, and I had expert qualitative researchers advising me. And um, you can definitely get an idiosyncratic group. So one piece of advice would be to definitely do more than one group because we did one group and it was like a bloodbath and then we did a second group and it was much more civil and constructive and and so those big and in focus groups those big personalities can really take over and um but in terms of um yeah the the, the pushback against the messaging for reducing care um i guess my tip with that was was you know i've been working on this with you ray for many years with wiser healthcare and we've gone back and forth as a group on how to best communicate things like overdiagnosis to the public, and it's it's a real tightrope, you know, that you you have to walk to to explain the. And I still don't think we have the answer to how do we best explain low value care to the public. I, I'm still not sure we have the answer, but we're maybe making steps towards it. But I guess my, um, I, I thought Vina explained it really well. You know that that the consequences to the patient, the consequences to the health system. Um, and the consequences to the community at large, I think that needs to be at the core of what we're doing. Like the, the best interest of the patient is always what we have at heart. And I think being very upfront about that when you're running groups on low value care interventions, being upfront that your, your primary interest is in getting the best care to patients, that you're not here to save money, you're not at a hospital administrator trying to, you know, improve the business um case uh so yeah I, I think they would be my two main reflections um and also advertisers i'm not sure i'd go back to advertisers to design an intervention i think i'd probably start with the community like vina is doing start with the community get the messaging from there and then maybe go to consultants that can do design and graphic design and do that creative side maybe after the because we went to advertisers first then we went took mm -hmm. that and went to the community and i think maybe i would flip that around that's a, that's a good tip. Yeah, I appreciate that. Does anybody else have a question? Peter. Sorry, I'm relearning how to use Zoom. Um, <laughs> thanks, guys. Great presentations. Uh, I'm really interested, Adrian, in, in you know the consequences and, and the incentives and, and why why would somebody want a diagnosis versus you know why would somebody not want a diagnosis. I'm really interested. I've been reading just in the last sort of week or so that people are now actively trying not to be diagnosed with ADHD because it might impact their ability to get a license. And so, you know, those are real drivers that are really going to um, going to make people's lives different. And, and similarly, Vinay, I'm really interested that that the you know some of the drivers that came out for ordering low value care were things like efficiency and resources. But that's counterintuitive because wouldn't we be burning up? resources inefficiently 
by ordering low value care? And, and how might we try and incentivize clinicians not to do that? I mean, what's in it for them? What's going to make their lives better and easier by not just doing the same old, I'm going to order a bank of tests because that's what we do. Doesn't matter if it's of, of great value. Um, but then I've done my bit. So the consequence thing is, is, is a bit safer. Um, how do we incentivize a better use of resources and more efficient healthcare and, and, and so that people don't just end up losing resources, they end up getting a, a better workplace, better work outcomes and the patients get a better outcome too. Benay, that was yours, yeah. Oh, Frida, I, I wish I had a, a, a straightforward answer. So um, the, the more time I spend with this topic, the grayer everything becomes. So my starting position three years ago was it's all black and white. <laughs> I'm going to do all this research and, and tell everybody to, to stop doing them. I, I think um, as the drivers have shown, uh, it's, it's, it's really complex and nuanced and challenging to to address these tests because a test the value of a test depends on the context and and the patient and the conversation so and obviously i have changed my practice in the last two years um and up until then i was part of the system i think i'm still part of the system but i i, I am more mindful of tests that i request now than i was two or three years ago but if you think about um what drives these tests for example if you take efficiency we 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 have key performance indicators quit queensland emergency access target or national emergency access tar target being one of them which we are measured against so there is this perception and i agree with you it's probably more perception than reality but perceptions shape our reality so the the current perception amongst emergency physicians in Townsville and probably everywhere else is doing all these tests, front loading them as we call them, right at very early in the patient journey, even before the patients are actually seen by the doctors, sets the ball rolling in their care so that by the time they get to see a doctor, which could be two, three, four, five, six hours, all these tests are done. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is just talk to the patient, make sure they're fine and they go home. That, that is the perception, and there's no data right now to actually say, no, that's the perception. So we all have assumed that's the reality. So if there's 30, 40, 50 patients waiting, this is what we're going to do to start their care. Um, yes, we can try and prove that it is a perception or not reality, but it will take some data to actually bring out the nuance because it's quite nuanced. So um, I hope some of my work will will help. Um, and and this, like Adrian, there's, there's so many others across Australia and across the world looking at the problem from different perspectives. But I, I just feel more and more that it, it's not going to be an easy answer. It's not going to be, hey, we'll do all of this and we'll reduce these tests because we still don't have any data about sustainability, sustainable, uh, effective interventions that sustain change for five, 10, 15, 20 years. So um, we, we're still starting to look at it now. Some some researchers are starting to. So I, I think it's it, it needs a culture change. At, at the end of it all, it, it is the culture that's driving everything because 30 years ago when we didn't have access to all these tests, or we didn't have this volume or demand for care, we probably didn't do as many tests. Um, I'm saying probably because I don't really have data to back me up. So it's the access the access to tests also, um, and as well as increasing demand for care. Um, mm. and, and we have noticed that over the last two decades. So I know it's, I'm sort of not answering your question, but... It, it is complex, to say the complex. least. Mm. It is, understood. Anybody else have a question? I have one. I have another. And, and you know, we've got six minutes left, but it's to both of you. Right? 
So, Vinay, on one of your slides, you had the highlighted stakeholder, right? It was seriously important. That was one of your big things. You needed to engage with stakeholders. You needed to get by. And that was that was one of the biggest things that you had to do. While you were saying that, Adrian was enthusiastically nodding, all right? Because that's a deal. That's a big deal. So for both of you, can you tell me what are some of the strategies uh, for you, Vinay, in your, in your department, Adrian, for you across multiple departments, what are some of the strategies you, you have used for stakeholders? Because people on this Zoom meeting are interested in that and they're going to want to do that. And your tips and tricks on how to engage stakeholders will be very important. Adrian, your mic's off. You're first. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, there's the formal research methods where you can really get in to understand the perspectives of your stakeholders. So the, the qualitative studies that um, Vinay has been doing and that I've done a few of, obviously that gives you really rich insights into people's perspectives. But it's not quite the same as partnering in research and getting buy-in to get a project happening. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that is, that that's tricky and that's all about human relationships and, and spending a lot of time going out and visiting the sites that you're going to be working and the people identifying the decision makers um, at a particular um, uh, department. And also um, I've found even if you have a department that's not particularly supportive, there's there's almost always one person who's really engaged in research or supportive. And, and so you can sort of go through them to find the powerful people and, and, you know, um, yeah, I mean, this, this is, yeah, this is, I know my colleague, Carissa Bono um, presented has done a lot in the cardiovascular space on how to identify stakeholders with power and and how to influence powerful people and that sort of thing and um, mm. she's got some great tips so I'd recommend Carissa Bonner reading some of her research but my personal experience again it's just it's those human relationships it's identifying the people who uh, can be champions at your site because without them you know luckily for my trial at all at eight different sites we've got a champion at each site who's really on board and they have influence over these to others who are just too busy and, and that sort of thing. So I think, yeah, that, that would be my main tip. Um, yeah, and doing <laughs> research like vinay has been doing. I think that's where you get the really rich insights and it makes you reflect on everything you're doing. Excellent, thanks. Vinay, what did you do that you think is what was helpful? What worked for you? Um, I think iterative conversations with, um, well, so right now, I would say the main stakeholders I have engaged are clinicians um, and 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 managers um, and some executives and board members. Um, it, it, it's about iterative conversations and it's about incrementally moving, um, pushing the envelope and trying to have the patients um, at the core of all conversations. So um, like um, we discussed earlier, one of the key barriers that might come up time and again is, oh, you're doing this to save money. Um, and that some of my colleagues have said that too, this is about saving money, isn't it? So, uh, and, and and like Adrian's experienced quite uh, vocally uh, that the public might feel the same thing too. And it's, it's, it's about how um, how you put the message across, I guess, and we're not going to achieve this um, overnight or in, in a few weeks, months. It's going to be an ongoing process with uh, the entire culture. And we need to change it at so many levels. Uh, we need to start probably in medical schools in year one to see to ensure the next generation is conversant with value-based healthcare. So it's, it's not just about, uh, like Adrian mentioned, it's not about reducing tests it's about doing the right test for the right patient at the right time so there might be over testing under testing so uh, this is probably a societal level thing so uh, all community members medical as well as non-medical um, politicians decision makers everyone has to be involved in the conversation um, in making sure that yes this might save money 
yes, this might be efficient, but in the end, it's better care. Mm -hmm. um, and and that needs to be a message. And I keep coming back to behavior change. So th this is about changing behavior. So yes, it's critically about clinicians' behavior, but it's also about patients' behavior, a community members' behavior. So, and behavior change is something that uh, behavioral scientists have looked into over the last few decades. Um, and uh, I'm sort of scratching the surface because that's what I, I intend to achieve, I guess, changing behavior. But you can't change anyone's behavior. They have to actually realize that they they need to change their behavior um, or you have to facilitate it by nudging as Adrian's trying to do uh, or so many other behavioral sort of interventions or strategies. So uh, we have to use science to guide us, but more importantly, uh, the conversations that we have with all the stakeholders, I think are going to be critical. Um, cool. That's good, thank you very much. Look, I want to thank both um, Adrian and Vinay um, for this topic. This is a great conversation. Um, I welcome you all back to the next webinar starting in January 2024. Adrian, thank you for the tip. I will tap Carissa on the shoulder and, <laughs> and I'll absolutely blame you for that. So that'll be oh, yes. <laughs> just wait till you get her email. Yes. Yeah, she'll thank you because she'll thank me. Oh, yes. she'll thank you. <laughs> all right. Thanks heaps, everybody, for coming. See you all in 2024. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ray. Thanks, Ray. Nice to see you. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot.